some just some some what I can interactions around. Then we talk about have to talk about can subsystem and the problems they have there. Uh, from my kind of list, uh, or like, sorry, <laughs> um, after that, I'm talking a little bit about what my current thoughts are about the flow plan and the uh, health question we have going. We have uh, Rahul talking about RPL. Um, then I have some time set in there for discussions, so that's like a bit of an overflow time for the discussions from the sessions before. I have some suggestions here of what we can talk about, but I'm happy on other topics as well. And the last one will be a talk, also with discussion time um, from ideas and words here. Okay, so um, Jamal asked us to have a bit more like an interactive session this time. So the years before we had mostly had like status update talks, some people sitting in the front and talking about it, and it's not really that much user interaction. Um, they want to have a bit more like ITF style workshop, uh, what we're meeting here. It's the first time we're doing that, so I need to figure out how to do that best. Can see that. Um, as I said, there's a small set of slides only from the presenters normally because we will leave room for the discussions. And if you have questions, just go ahead and ask. That should be the same to you. Um, because there are not that many people, I would like if you can just go around quickly. Everyone has like one or two sentences about why he's here, where he's coming from, what the background is, and so on. And uh, if anybody would be happy to help me with the minutes, that would be appreciated. So is there anybody who would step forward for that? We got eight minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I think uh, we'll just start around with one problem here. So um, my name is Stefan. Um, it's the CEO of the Open Source Group. What I'm talking about here is not really my main job there. That's like a 10% thing I'm, I'm allowed to spend some time on. Um, my background is that I already worked on 15.4 in the kernel uh, doing my diploma thesis like six or seven years back when I was uh, still doing my studies. Um, since then, together with Alexander over there, we maintain the 15.4 subsystem. Um, the kernel and yeah, slowly making progress. Yeah, not as fast as we would like because it's not really our day job to do that. Um, but that's the background of why I'm here. And I wanted to bring this kind of smaller interest topics still to NetDev, and that's why I started the IT workshop and trying to get other subsystems joining in. So should we switch over, Mark? Uh, I mean, I can, I can, I can just hold it. Can you? Uh, hi, I'm Mark. Uh, Mark Kleinbrüder. I'm uh, with Spangotronics. Uh, so is my colleague Alexei. Uh, I'm the maintainer of the CAN uh, subsystem in the Linux kernel. And yeah, as uh, Stefan said, it's not my uh, my 100% part at Spangotronics, but only 10%. But I have a big few of patches uh, to take in because I have so much uh, other work to do. I hope it gets better in the in the near future, and um, yeah, I have some some topics I want to discuss um, here it's on the slides of Alexei. Too, uh, it's about uh, the schedule of the network device and then copying packets. Uh, this doesn't really fit into the CAN world. Um, if you use a quad scheduler, and, uh, that is that system the enforces and. This is one of the topics I'm interested in. Thank you. Hi. Is it working? Yeah. Um, my name is Alexei Rempel. Um, I am working together with Mark, and I am not yet maintainer of uh, J9039 uh, stack on top of Ken. Um, yeah, I will try to show some reasons why why I'm, we are porting or why we are trying to provide kernel support, kernel level support of this stack uh, in my slides. Yeah, will be more later. Hi, my name is Andreas Ferber. Um, I work at uh, Zuse Labs. Um, I'm in project and release management there, so uh, not working on network stack normally. So that's also kind of a 10% thing. Um, and I've been looking into a number of new wireless technologies that are currently not yet represented in the kernel and uh, searching for uh, ways to um, make them accessible in suitable ways and uh, pretty much 
brought a bunch of questions that an RFC on the NetDev list really um, hasn't managed to quite clarify yet. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Alexander Aring, and um, yeah, I'm the currently maintainer of the six Lopen stack in the news kernel with Yuka, Yuka Rineisen. He is not here at the moment, but um, he's more doing the uh, Bluetooth uh, adaptation for six Lopen. I'm more at the 802.15.4 side, and also that's why I'm involved also in um, 802.15.4 with Stefan together. And yeah, it's not my full task anymore, sadly. But um, I'm still working in other networking correlated topics. Um, but when I have time, I try to um, improve this implementation and also working with other IoT open IoT OS around like uh, Riot OS, they, they know me and um, then, yeah, we, we try to make some new innovations and uh, try to make more stack testing and something like that uh, together that we, that both communities also uh, have something from this. Uh, my name is John Malloy. I'm working at Ericsson. I am the originator and uh, main maintainer of the TIPC protocol stack. Uh, so my main interest here is around the IP stack in general, just to learn more about it uh, so that I can progress in my own work with it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kirmata Suroshka. I am working in company Hostinger, and it is uh, web hosting industry, so, and I'm not so experienced as you are, and uh, that's why I'm here. So I am just working with a basic network stack in web hosting, so it's not something fancy. And I'm here with my colleague Donatas Abraitis, and he is contributing a lot uh, to the OSPV uh, uh, project. So maybe later Donatas can uh, say more uh, about his work, and that's all. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, I'm David Lamparder, um, although people call me Equi. Um, I am a maintainer on the FR routing um, suite that does the dynamic routing stuff for normal networks. Um, so that's my day job. My, my night job is <laughs> putting together random crap at the hackerspace. So I do know the, the Linux CAN API because we use that for light control stuff and so on. And, um, but I don't really have a lot of contact points with IoT otherwise. So I'll, I'm just curious. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Rahul Jadov. I've been working on the mesh networking part for the IoT. So I'm going to talk about uh, RPL or the Ripple the routing protocol uh, in my uh, talk. Uh, we have been using Ripple primarily on 802.15.4 and PLC uh, for home automation and smart meters, all the metering use cases for that matter. So I work for Huawei Technologies in India. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Luke Williams. I work for uh, Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu. Uh, I'm a technical architect. Uh, I work for our devices branch uh, at Canonical uh, with primary focus on IoT and uh, the networking uh, stacks and stuff like that. That's my primary focus. Thanks a lot. So I think that at least it helps me a bit to understand what, what people are here, what are the interests for that and so on. So um, yeah, I think we have these things covered. I think we, can, we are a bit early, but we can switch to Ken already. So if you guys want to go on stage. Here you go. <laughs> You're not even doing that. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> okay. Can sorry, 20 minutes. Can you, so you will have the uh, counter there and the uh, slides over over here. Okay. Should they switch it? Also? Yeah. Great. Uh, 
Again, my name is Alexey Rempel, I work for Pergotronics. Um, first of all, uh, somehow should I introduce how CAN works or how socket CAN works, or it will take too much time for 15 minutes. So I skip the parts on how it works and I'll explain more things why we're doing this. So before Socket Can was introduced, some I think about 2013, um, Can Pass was uh, managed in user space by applications. It was made uh, by different vendors, uh, and uh, major problems uh, this was uh, there was no compatibility with, uh, between different limitations, knowing uh, tooling, uh, testing coverage, and so on until they came to great solution, so it came. Um, now we have a hardware abstraction layer. And finally, uh, companies, uh, one for two, uh, who make socks, um, started to actively participate in main learning, and it is good. So we have not to go all the job ourselves. And uh, well, they uh, started to have more parts in kernel, like uh, different stack layers. And one of these stack layers will be introduced by me. Um, and we have uh, more tooling now. So we have hidden utils, scan tests, Wireshark, XYZ, if there are some more tools based on socket cam, if you know it is there. Uh, the J1949 stack is right now in the same shape like socket cam was in for six years. Um, we have different uh, limitations uh, in user space. And some of them, some of them are based on socket can, some not. Uh, um, about the existence of uh, these implementations, I already heard from uh, different developers, but as usual, like no more to tell anyone about this. The typical issues with this stack in user space, well. I already talked about this, there is no unified implementation, so if one company buys uh, stack implementation from other company, there is really a hard way to migrate to other implementation. Uh, this stack uh, defines a lot of strictly timings, and to be able to handle these timings, the user space should uh, fill low latency requirements, so usually these implementations run with uh, real-time priorities and uh, need to get mostly all packets from canvas. It means a lot of copies from users uh, from kernel to user space, and only then analyze if we actually need these packages or not. And so the Sai uh, J 1939 uh, stack is like a root implementation or root definition, and there are some uh, standards which are based on this stack. For example, Isobos NDR 2000 is for um, ships and so on, Isobos is for tracks and uh, Heavy which which vehicles and mill can is for military stuff. Theoretically, the current implementation from uh, now should be able to support all of these stacks, but we uh, have never tested it. If you have some access or need to play with uh, these protocols, then tell us. What we are trying to arrive with uh, kernel set implementation is uh, simple, relatively simple programming for that, with all possible challenges that we have, and uh, better performance because uh, we don't have to uh, 
have real time, well, no, not really. Uh, we don't have to be really strictly real time in the space, uh, and uh, we don't have to copy everything to the space. Uh, uh, with some tests, um, I make six. Uh, and full fully loaded bus, so we had only one two percent CPU load with current implementation. The most of challenges, or one of the challenges, is a huge M2. It's 112 megabyte and is a bus. So if you make a send with the uh, socket. You should be able to work with this and so on. And currently, it is a uh, uh, main discussion point. How we should implement this? Should we split it in user space and try to uh, fill the uh, socket uh, buffer? Or, yeah, there's some. Yes. Do, do, do you mean uh, the MTU is 112 megabytes? The MTU? Is that the um, it's not the transmission unit of the underlying CAN protocol, it's the maximum packet size. Uh, yeah, it's uh, like on IP you ha can have uh, 64 bytes and then IP does the segmentation. And with that J1939 you have a max packet size of 112 megabytes. This is segmented into lots of can packages of seven bytes of payload <laughs> and <laughs> and one byte of uh, uh, header information, which is basically just a counter, counting from zero to uh, uh, FF. Um, yeah, and the network stack does not really cope with if you do a send of 112 megabytes. Uh, does not really cope with this uh, because we want to um, we want to keep the information that this 112 megabytes is one message because on the lower layer it does a header and then it says yeah they are going to come 112 megabytes and then you have to transfer all of this uh, the kernel has to and um, you cannot come back to user space and say, yeah, I've, I've sent like 60 megabytes and now do the rest and then send another packet. You, ha you have to continue that packet that has already been started. So this is a bit problematic. But we have found a solution, at least for, for the sending side. We, have, uh, uh, we just keep on going. And um, now we're going to add signal support. That this is probably working. So then when you have a 112 megabyte send and there comes a signal, you have to go back to user space and then you have to continue that send. So the kernel has to keep the state. I have sent so many megabytes and now I have to continue that without sending a new header frame, but continuing the stream. And this all has to be done within certain timings <laughs> so but but the network is quite slow it just runs with 250 kilobytes per second so if you get a signal you have to continue your send within the buffer you have already queued in the kernel because otherwise the stream um, gets interrupted and then you get a timeout from the receiving side and to transfer one under 12 the right can take like 30 hours. Many hours? <laughs> 30. 30. Um, another issue which was discovered just yet, at least for me, uh, is the FQ model. Yeah. So uh, when you're talking about CAN here, then you're talking about strictly about the original CAN and not CANFD, or can this also be used on top of CANFD? Um, the socket can works with CANFD. We have several uh, drivers mainline and uh, some waiting for review. This J1939, which we're just discussing the topic, I think it has not been standardized for CANFD. But I'm not a real expert in J1939.
CANFD would seem to allow slightly larger packet sizes than those mentioned seven bytes, but well, not much larger still. Yeah, it does allow at maximum of 64 minus probably the header, so, but I don't think that has been standardized. The kernel internal stack currently assumes that you run standard CAN. Yeah. Uh, about if you build, we already talked here in the small press. Uh, should we repeat this topic again? Yeah. Uh, the main issue is that uh, you should know if package was dropped. There is uh, no real good handling, and we can ask like. Uh, can you can you uh, open the first slide, the one with the rocket? So as everybody knows, between the protocol family, that's a gray blob, and the network hardware that's below. Uh, so this can zero, can one, we have the packet scheduler and the routing. The routing we don't use that can because we don't have something like this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the packet scheduler is there. And uh, if you send uh, yeah, many frames, uh, from the user space to um, to the uh, to a specific hardware to, for example, can zero. You have the packet scheduler that schedules the packets, so you can send like whatever 20 packets or so, and the hardware sends it out uh, as fast as it can. Um, and uh, if you use systemd in your system, systemd sets uh, the Cordle scheduler as default if you don't change anything. And this kernel has been, uh, as far as I know, optimized for uh, TCP and Ethernet, uh, asymmetric bandwidth, uh, Wi-Fi, and so on. And um, as if I understand it correctly, it uh, drops packages in the front of the queue if the queue um, grows larger than five milliseconds. Oh, there is a burst limit of 100 milliseconds or so, um, but packets are dropped. And on CAN, the network itself, uh, so the underlying hardware tries to guarantee that you don't uh, lose packets. And uh, there even is a hardware-based retransmission if there is no one listening for packets. Um, so it's really hard uh, to explain your chief engineer that uh, your Linux system drops packets because uh, it thinks the queue is too long. Uh, so. Uh, for now, if you send a bulk uh, amount of data with your CAN um, and use Kotl as your scheduler, uh, you see packets drop, dropping. Um, but you don't see it on the sending side, only if you look at the um, traffic scheduler tools, um, then you can look it up. But uh, your normal send system call just comes back and says, yeah, I've sent the packet and the network driver uh, the sensor packets, but the scheduler in between drops them and you get no um, real feedback to user space. Now, this is a problem here. Um, if you stay to FIFO, the PF FIFO scheduler, um, you get noticed uh, because it drops at the end and then your send system call just returns and says, uh, I have no buffers left, uh, please try again later. Um, this is a problem we face here on CAN because you don't get noticed that your packet has been dropped. Um, and then there is this, air quotes, usual blaming. System D blames the kernel, and the kernel blames System D. Why does System D set this default? And this uh, System D says, yeah, why doesn't the driver specify which queuing discipline it wants to have? Um, as far as I can see, there is. Uh, no interface that the driver can specify, I want to have this packet scheduler, this queuing discipline, or I want to have another. Um, what I have in mind is maybe the driver can say, uh, yes, I'm a network uh, interface, and I don't tolerate that you drop packets in your scheduler without noticing the user. Maybe this is a, some kind of interface we want to or we can add there in the driver. 
someone here who is uh, who is familiar with uh, packet schedulers and stuff? I, I think I think you know this this problem is not specifically related to the queuing discipline. Uh, you know this problem is related to the feedback that we expect from the link layer to be propagated up uh, to the above layer. Specifically, if there is a drop, is is this? Is this uh, because this same requirement we have in context to 15.4 as well, where we want to know whether a unicast packet that has been transmitted and has been acknowledgement, uh, and if it has acknowledged, or whether if it has not been acknowledged, uh, if, if there is some way of propagating the same feedback to the above layer. So, what I'm trying to say is, irrespective of the queuing discipline, because the queuing discipline doesn't have any input from uh, the below layer. So, uh, even if you change the queuing discipline, it won't it won't really help. Um, if you stick to PFFIFO, um, that that helps on the can side at least. We you I, uh, then we got a feedback to you from you to user space that a packet has been dropped inside the scheduler. Alexander. So. Um, to the feedback according to the acknowledgement, um, if there was an acknowledgement or not, wireless has already such feature, and this goes over the socket error queue to um, get a feedback back if there was an acknowledgement or not. So far I know this is also some bit flag currently in some in a bit field mapped that um, it's currently only used in wireless, but we can also use it. I think for 800 to 54 because it depends on the link layer. Uh, is it a general network device flag or is it specific to 5.4 or 11 or? I have no idea, but uh, Johannes Berg is here also on the <laughs> conference. You can ask him. Um, there is a huge uh, system D issue where things are being discussed. And there was a proposition to um, add the no queue flag to the network device, but it doesn't work. It gives different feedback. It says uh, link down if the queue is full. And if you do something wrong, even the kernel says a uh, virtual interface or a virtual device trying to schedule a queue packet, something like this. And then uh, someone pointed out that the uh, Dot 11 guys have switched their network devices to no queue at all. And I'm wondering, I had no time to look it up, but I'm wondering uh, how they do it. So the queue len of your Wi Fi interface in Linux, uh, maybe you can check. Do you run Linux currently? Can you check the queue len of your Wi Fi interface? It should be zero as far as I. I uh, notice from that discussion. So the, I remember there was some change from um, where they changed the, as in the no queue was really COQ at first, but somebody added a flag to make some performance hint in the kernel that, um, yeah, it's just some speed up or, or not. This, I have no queue before it was really the TXQ lang was CO. And somebody added this flag to make some performance um, speed ups. Uh, I don't remember. Okay, maybe we can talk to uh, we can find the wireless guys and talk to them. Um, we just looked here on on a random laptop, and it has a queue line of one thousand. Maybe something different. But in wireless and in the uh, uh, five point four, you have got um, ascending. Soft IRQ or worker or something? A separate one? Uh, you, you have a different, you, you have a context on your own, not just a net TX soft IRQ, but a, a separate one? Okay, details. Um, so has someone questions on, on this or a different topic? 
the, does that already conclude the J1939 or just this particular discussion about the? Just the QLens. The, just the uh, packet scheduler. I think we have some input and find the right guys here <laughs> and talk to them. So there is a wireless workshop, I think, one or two rooms over there. It's a whole day, so you should can slip in there and if not, just find Johannes or something to get some idea on the how they're using the feedback on the socket error queue. And we have a few more minutes, so if you have other questions on CAN, we can, we can do that as well now. Um, yeah, regarding the socket error queue, um, we want to add this to the J1939 as well. I think it was one of one of the features. You basically can, uh, I think it's a receive message or something like this from user space, and then you can, from the kernel, um, put a auxiliary data somewhere and say uh, this certain packet got a error or something and even specify what kind of error. So you can do this from, I think you are not the driver but the packet family or something in the middle. You can attach information to a, uh, you, you can put information to the uh, your receiving socket and um, can somehow identify the packet that had a problem. Yeah, that's uh, just a normal socket op. We have that, we have that in 15.04 as well for the link quality indicator value. We have that just recently added for that. And we have more information so we'll actually ask him for, for routing specific purpose on, on top. Um, we need to add more information there, but we have it for LQA, LQA so that's a really simple patch. I mean, that's really easy to add, actually. So, um, do you have other questions for Ken, or because you... Do you have any slide that shows how the usage of the uh, um, 1939 stack looks like? Uh, socket, bind, connect, read, write. Um, is this still in the PF CAN family, like a new um, SOC constant that you're adding this, or how does it fit in with, you know, the, the raw CAN sockets? Uh, you don't open a raw CAN socket, you open a CAN J1939 socket. So it's a... Uh, I'm not sure about the details, but it's... Yeah, open a J1939 socket and then uh, basically behaves now or when we are finished like UDP. You can, you have to bind to your uh, interface and then can read message, uh, send message, or if you connect, you don't have to specify the, um, the destination address. So it's a perfect landing on time. So if there are more questions on this? No? Okay, so thanks a lot, two of you. And we are switching to the next one. I will leave the mic here for questions. Okay, so next one is on me. Um, Something I want to discuss is here um, how we are going to handle a user space API for all the different header compression techniques um, six low time offers. So we have header compression um, in the kernel for quite some years now, used by 15.4 and used by the Bluetooth subsystem as well. But the, step, the status we have right now is that they are always only being able to be controlled by loading or unloading the modules. So there's no user space facing API to that. We did that on purpose initially to avoid having an API via here afterwards. So we want to really start simple, but then we didn't we didn't really keep on progressing there. I mean, it's working for the things we are we are want to do, like um, IP header compression and UDP next header compression. So that's working out of the box. But if you get a more complex scenario for deployment or something, that really falls apart. So that's something we need to think about. So just a little bit of background here for everybody to understand that. So it's a shared subsystem by 1504 Bluetooth. 
and we support different header compressions coming from, um, specified by the ITF being IP header compression as well as next header compression for UDP and, and other things. Um, we have stub implementations for things like um, death fragment hop and all this kind of different um, packets you might have around there. They are defined in RFC uh, 6282. Um, we also have some stop implementations for generic header compression. Um, again, for various various parts of the system here. Um, all of them are not really production quality, I would say. Some of them just detect the a message coming in, but they're not handling them at all, just to, to find out about that. So that's something that needs to be extended. But in, to do that, we really need to have a way to use it and configure it in the first place. So that's why I want to bring it up. As I said, the, what we really use in practice right now is the IP header compression together with UDP. So that's what it actually wants in the main use cases, so that's fine, but yeah, it should be obvious. Okay, so um, the problem that I've been thinking about, the problems we need to, to tackle here. Um, we need some way to track the neighbors, the neighbor cache you would have from Ethernet, for example. It might be a bit different in the mesh network with 1504, for example. Um, but it's kind of a chicken egg problem to decide when you want to transmit a compressed um, frame to one of, one of your peers, for example. Because you don't know if you're able to decode it or not, to uncompress it. So uh, that's something you need to keep track around. If you get a message from node A, for example, compressed in a specific scheme or something, you need to note it down in some kind of data structure to make sure you understand this node is able to uh, um, use this kind of generic header conversion, for example. Um, GHC actually discovered that they needed a way to notify other peers in the, in the mesh about the capability. So what they introduced was a capability indicator option um, that getting sent out by neighbor discovery addressing the simulation packets. That's something you could do that's not defined for the other um, header compressions uh, before, like NHC or IBHC. Um, but for GHC, actually, um, I think it's actually mandatory to support that. Um, we need to fill on the sub implementations, but that's just groundwork, I would say, once we have all the other things in place. Um, and we also need to think about other uh, protocols coming up, especially like the LPVA, uh, WA things. Do they, actually have, do they actually have header compression schemes, like static header compressions coming up and other things? Is it something that fits in the system we have right now? Are there problems with that? And that's something we also have to think about in the future. Also. But as I said, the biggest problem I see right now is that we don't have any way of configure, uh, configure that from user space. I want to go ahead and start implementing something like that, but I really want to start something really simple um, because I don't want to over-engineer that and then really regret it when they want to deploy it and then release this kernel and then we see that we need to change it. So my proposal is really simple for now. I want to have a split there um, where the key kernel keeps track of the state of the neighbors and um, have a data structure somehow that indicates uh, what kind of header compressions are supported and what kind of are selected from user space. So if you have different options that are available, you would have to have a way from user space saying, okay, for this node, I want to uh, use this header compression. So you have to have, uh, keep track on that in the kernel. That's at least how I see it. And user space will handle all the policy decisions on that. So you might have a one-time configuration um, utility that sets it for the whole network. You might have something long-running and um, daemon for for example, routing data or something that also wants to handle this kind of information. Um, yeah, but that is the split I want to have there. Um, where to put the data structure, how to attach that, and how to make sure that we are not uh, cluttering the fast pass is a different topic, but that's uh, how you can actually integrate it. And uh, just as all the other networking stuff, I would suggest going with the networking based uh, interface here, that just because all the other ones are networking based already. So. So a bit, a bit more detail on that. As I mentioned before, I wanted to have like um, different tooling options. So one is like having a tool like uh, uh, IWPM, which we use for 15.04. That's just a one-time configuration. You type in something, it, it configures the state, it's uh, a current. 
Um, as Bluetooth has the same with, uh, with the Bluetooth uh, command line utilities, but they also have the Bluetooth daemon on it. So you want to have different ways of um, configuring configure it, keep the state in the kernel, and still display it to the next uh, utility or tool that might use it and keep track of it. Um, another situation you might have is some ripple daemon or something running. And that actually wants to get control of all these details to make sure everything runs smoothly. It's more like, like a network management daemon running doing this kind of things. System D could be an example for that as well. I don't think that will really deploy the kind of scenarios, but it might be an option. Um, one thing that is really problematic uh, is that if you have clashing devices coming from user space from different um, policy decisions, for example, um, you need to have some, some stuff that keeps it safe in the kernel, but on the other hand, uh, you need to make sure that uh, it leaves the policy decisions and all this kind of screw-ups to the administration part of the, of the system. Because that's not, not something you can really do in the kernel and handle all. You should stay safe, obviously, but we uh, can't do all these things there. Um, for the data structures, so now we go into the time where we actually um, where I want to get some feedback. So, um, I was thinking about using the new SKB Visual Data extension for this kind of data structures. Um, I mean, there's a talk about that at this conference. I will, I will go to that and figure out if that's, if that's a good possibility for us to do. But what um, makes it interesting for me is that it actually does not put any pressure or annoyances to other um, protocols. Ethernet and normal IP stuff and so on, so you can just attach it if you have a Node 4 network running, and there's no extra cost for the task path in the kernel or something. So that might be something where we can actually add new data structures, where we need information and stuff to be to keep track without um, polluting any of the core data structures. Um, but I have to figure out how that really works in practice. I've now not done any proof of concept on that, so that's just my raw thinking about that for now. Um, but we need to have some way um, to keep this kind of state. I mean, we also need it for for mesh health status, for example. So I'm talking about a rule about that. We need some way of having information about how the link layer um, health status is, how often we have to reset the packets um, because there has been like a drop frame or something on the lower today. And then we need to have some um, in wireless for the quality indicator or something. All this stuff is there. It needs to be um, exposed to user space in a way, but it also needs to be uh, kept in the kernel and, and can track of it. So that's um, what I try to mix together. Okay, so um, is there any feedback on that? Does anybody have like the um, same problems or solutions for the problem? So the problem has a question, I think. Hello? Yeah. Is this working? Hello? Hello? Hello, is it all right? So uh, the question is uh, regarding the you mentioned uh, extending the neighbor table or the neighbor state information. Uh, it doesn't necessarily has to be the neighbor table. Um, we need to have some. I haven't we really defined where to put that? We need some data structure um, where we actually can keep track on, on the neighbors. Neighbor table would be an option for that. Definitely, but we have to see that actually will work out now. Because uh, the, the reason why I mentioned this is because if we keep the information in the neighbor state information in the neighbor table itself, it would end up extending the structure just for this purpose. And I don't know whether there is a way to uh, not complicate stuff for other link layers like Ethernet and. Uh, I mean that is that is a problem. So every time you come up from a subsystem, oh, Alexander, oh, go ahead. <laughs> we talking about the IP neighbor um, neighbor uh, structure. Uh, yeah, um, we are already storing some link layer information there, which is this short address. But the struct nay, it has a, like the netdev interface, a private um, memory area. So you can say for this net device, for this type, I want to ha have a type specific extension, you, you say allocate this memory more and then use it as a private memory ar area where you can store additional memories for this specific NetDev interface. So when this is six low pan, currently we use in the private area structure of the net device of six low pan, you have the 
link layer information, which can be currently Bluetooth or 802.15.4. And then we make the same thing again. We, in the neighbor, there exists a six low pen specific private area. Then this should be some storage information, which is um, six low pen only. I don't know when uh, you have some compression, which are on all uh, linked layers, 802.15.4 and Bluetooth, or two of them, then um, it should be stored there, but then there exists per neighbor also an additional linked layer uh, private area, where currently, currently there is the short address. You can dig into the code, and there are some private memory area len lengths, so when the kernel allocates the structure neighbor, that it allocates more memory for your storage, what you want to have per neighbor additional. And I mean, the thing is for, um, that, is, that could be a good place actually for the information on the, in, the uh, hyperconfession support in your neighbors, in your, your mesh neighbors. Um, I think it gets complicated if we want to store information that's really raw 15.4, like uh, make retries for uh, sending frames, uh, AQI, AQI value and stuff like that. Because then it's not, you can use 15.4 without this low plan, right? So in that case, we wouldn't have the IP neighbor cache around because we would have just a lower level on that. So I would need to think if you could attach a data structure to just the, uh, you want to say something? Because you, no, I listen. Okay. Um, you might need to split up where we put the information um, in the layer two and then layer three and then merge together in the IP cache, for example. So, but as I said, I really need to look at the data structures and find a way to do it um, that is not putting any extra cost on other L2 layers yeah. or something, because that is something that will be rejected definitely. Um, so we need to find ways where we actually have, like, like some already explained, have, like private data structures which are only allocated and used if 504 is in use or. Bluetooth or whatever, um, and then they're not making any trouble for the past part of the But yeah, um, that's something I have in mind there for. But I really, the interface I wanted to really keep simple for if you want to send out a new frame, I only want to have like a lookup to find out based on the, uh, based on the address I want to send to, um, find out what kind of uh, schemes are supported and then we have a way to actually have indication from user space which are the preferred schemes to use for this node and then sending it out. Okay. So that would be really the simple interface I have in mind right now um, because I don't want to over-engineer that. I mean, you can add more APIs to that in the end um, but that is the, the lines I'm thinking about right now. So I will hope I will have some time to, to look into that in detail and actually do some code and do a proof of concept on that. I can't really make time promises on that, but I, I want to work on that and send an RFC at some point. Yeah. Um, so for the short address, it was just um, this is already this information we get from the neighbor discovery messages. They are ad address options where we get it, and um, for link layer specific, more link layer specific things that we, you don't get from neighbor discovery protocols, yeah, then um, we need to have some other place. Okay. And yeah. Uh, so the other question was regarding, so m most of the compression schemes that are mentioned here are for the data plane. The IPHC, the NH and extractor compression, the generator compression are, are all for data plane. There are certain compression scheme for the control plane as well, especially for uh, source routing header compression, 6 low RH, 8138, RFC 8138. Yeah, I actually haven't looked at that. I, I'm wondering that one of the things um, I was mentioning here, all the other things that are getting specified right now, um, if they actually fit into what we have designed in the subsystem or not, I'm not 100% sure, but we are, I'm happy to, to have that extended. I mean, Alexander and I mean I don't know how active Yuka still is, but Alexander is still reviewing Petros for security. Oh okay, all right. Okay. So there has been a consideration, that's what you're saying. I mean it's not really something I or someone else are planning on working on, but if there's someone want to put that in the subsystem, we are happy to review it and extend the, the system for that. So. 
Ist das not, uh, is this in the GHC, is there not a part where they tackle the issue that um, to discover what the neighbor is supported according to the compressions? Uh, yeah. So that's what they, what they do that again over neighbor discovery, um, yeah. which is something, I mean, you know, it's, it's not really working that well on the Linux. But mm. not so you. Yeah. Okay, because I, I remember we had problems um, when testing against Riot and Contiki before that doesn't really try to see what it Maybe it's better now. So. Yeah, we only support UDP compression or what? Uh, I mean, but, yeah, no, no, I mean, I was thinking about neighbor discovery if it was all working together. Ah, uh, yeah. Other states. Yeah, I remember this. Mm. But maybe that's this, fixed by now. Yeah, are very detailed. I don't want to go okay. in. <laughs> Fair enough. So, but yeah, I mean, they have this capability indicator of sending out the um, information, what, what the nodes support around that. I don't know if we could leverage that for all the NHC things before, or if we can just make a point and say, okay, we expect that IPHC and NHC for UDP, for example, are mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, I would expect that actually by now, because all the deployments I would think have at least these things mandatory, but uh, yeah, it's always hard to make things like hard code in the kernel that they have to deploy and might, that might differ. But at least the sense that we have right now is that it's just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alex, you might recall that we had a discussion um, related to NOcean protocol, which is pretty similar to that neighbor discussion in that it also kind of requires to store some additional. Um, the descriptive data of like what profile or other kind of configuration a remote device refers to. And for now, I was kind of resorting to device tree, although I think that it's not really a clean solution because it would like describe remote devices as if they were local and it wouldn't work with ACPI. So if we could abstract this concept going beyond just like IP level neighbors to also describe like arbitrary protocols yeah. neighbors, that could be a helpful okay. solution. I, I need to look into that. I don't want to make it too complicated, but I, I, I see the point. I need to look at what the notion actually, what kind of information they actually need, how much that is, and how we actually could fit that together into the same data structure. So, uh, um, not knowing any, anything about Ocean, uh, do, do they have a discovery scheme? Can, can you discover the capabilities you want to store? You can discover the existence of devices, but you can't discover how they interpret the payload data. Yeah, so that's basically the chicken of egg problem. Is if I send a compressed header to some device, I don't know if it supports it or not. So it's just different configuration. Okay, uh, I need to look into that. Um, uh, sorry if this is a really stupid question, but if you put the neighbor data into the neighbor table on the IP level, wh what happens if a neighbor has more than one address? Is, is that even supported, or...? You mean a uh, link layer address? Uh. Well. <laughs> you, you were saying earlier that you could put the data into the neighbor table in the kernel, but that is the IP neighbor table, right? Or would you, would you create a separate neighbor table for the link layer? Which probably you could, I guess, but... That's what we're just discussing. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, the problem is we are not sure if we have, can just rely on just using six flow for that, so IP section in that case. Um, but we have stuff in the layer two as well. So I mean, on 5.4, for example, we have like, already have like two different uh, addressing schemes. The extended one, which is 64-bit, and then uh, this short one for 16-bit. So uh, that's really already a problem already there. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure where to put it, what is the safest, uh, safest place for that. I actually need to try out some things here. That's why I actually want to bring it up as a really early discussion. Uh, keep us in touch because uh, we have two addressing schemes in uh, J1939 as well. Uh, so there is a 8-byte uh, address which is uh, then mapped to a 8-bit address. So. I mean, Alexander did most of the things already for Fitment uh, Forming. We have that in place. It is working for short and extended. There are some places that are not that nicely, I would say, but, but I mean, most of the stuff is uh, already kind of correct. Yeah, we don't have any MAC address or IP address, so maybe. Yeah, we will we'll look in that stuff. 
we, we already have an implementation, but why to duplicate stuff when there's something around in the kernel? Yeah, I can. I think we talked already about it from last conference about wireless has this station dump and they do some R hash table there and yeah. True. I mean, we can think about I mean, R hash table for station dump that could be something for the big information like map yeah. requires and so on. Um, and then, okay, so we don't have, I mean, I'm not buying to the idea, or bound to the idea that um, I want to have like header compression and layer two information into one data structure. Might be better to split that off and have it in different parts of the system and just find a way to actually expose it to um, the space in the same way as something. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, but I have some feedback here, that's good. And I'll need to think about that and then hopefully come forward with some implementation at some point. Any more questions on that? Suggestions? Things? Rants? No rants? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so we switch over to Guru. For Guru. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so I'll be talking about Ripple, the routing protocol, uh, which is used mostly on top of 8.254, but other declares as well. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the integration with the kernel. Frankly speaking, we ended up not using integrating the Ripple directly with the kernel. We had a user space implementation of Ripple. And some of the problems that we faced while integration, so this is something that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so the use cases, so we are using uh, Ripple uh, on two different link layers, PLC, all line communications, and the 8.2.15.4. For smartphone, we ended up using uh, low power Wi-Fi. Both of them deploying to Ripple as a mesh network protocol. I said that both of them are currently into pilot phase, not into deployment. Uh, the Ripple routing protocol we carved out from the Quantic implementation. We made it work across three platforms: WIP, MicroIP, and the Linux uh, uh, kernel. For Linux kernel, our primary use case was water router on it. So we don't have the six LRs or six LM the router nodes or the leaf nodes running Linux. So the router nodes and the leaf nodes were running regular SOCs, TIMS, SOCs or uh, some other SOCs. So what I'm trying to say is we have the same Ripple code working across all the three different platforms. Mode of integration, so let me just talk about uh, one of the mode of integration which is most popular as, and has been mostly used till date, which is the slip mode of integration, wherein uh, you use you don't directly make use of the Linux kernel. You take the uh, you, you have you have the, the, the point is good, okay. so you make use of another device which connects over slip over USB to the Linux PC and then most of the compression decompression happens here and the packet is directly forwarded to the same interface here. So this is this is the this is the mode of uh, usage that most of the deployments have gone into. While we don't think this is the best way of handling things for these reasons. For material interface handling, for PLC and 8.2.15.4, if you have it together, it means things particularly complicated. Second, the Linux interface management tools are not useful in, this, in, in that case. The performance is a big factor. Having said that, we don't expect millions of packets per second or even thousands of packets per second, so performance is not a big criteria, but, but, but the SIP is not a good thing to use for such if, if, if uh, performance is Arpel cross linkages, what I mean by uh, Arpel cross linkages is where, where, which are the different interfaces that are required. So if you see here the, the Arpel code, it talks to app or we can call it management interfaces, there is plugin interfaces if we have, we have multiple objective functions. Uh, anyway, this can be considered as part of Arpel code as well. The primary problem is, is the table interfaces. We have four tables, the router table, neighbor table, prefix table, and parent table, parent table and prefix table. Uh, so, uh, something very specific to Arpel Core, uh, which has to be integrated with. The second, the, the other, so there, there are some changes that are required in these tables for Arpel handling. And then there are Arpel interfaces. What I mean by Arpel interfaces is that if you have a link layer transmission problem or issues, or you, if you want to modify about the signal strength, then those uh, information will be transmitted from this uh, Arpel interfaces. And then the ISMB interfaces is a very standard. So, uh, you need to have your own uh, handles mixture for ICMP 6 
So uh, for, from the L2 perspective, from the L2 interface perspective, we need to register for L2 failure and success events. For every unicast packet, if it's a successful transmission, so the, for, for the metric calculation, we need to know how many times was the packet retried at the link layer to calculate the metric information. And for the table interfaces, for the routing table, there are two modes of operation that table operates in. One is storing and one is non-storing in non-storing mode. Yeah. There are no routing tables at 6 LRs. So the source routing header is being used by the water router to send uh, the complete routing. Uh, the SRH is being made use of for the complete end to end routing. The parent table, so there could be more than one upstream parent information that has to be maintained by every 6 LR. This is needed when the node has to be switched in, in case of event failure, link failure or the node failure. These are pretty standard interface, I'm not going to talk about that. So what we ended up doing, so for the Ripple and on the, uh, for, for Linux, we ended up using Ripple in user space. We used raw sockets for our control power. Uh, so for routing table management, for storing MOP, we ended up using RT, RT Netlink. So we ended up changing the routing table itself. Having said that, we had to still keep some information in the user space uh, as well because there are certain facts regarding related to the path sequence and sequence number management, whether to know whether it's a stale uh, routing update or not. That has to be kept in the user space. For the non-storing MOP, we ended up using the complete routing table keeping the noted around table in the user space itself. Because the information was too much, uh, we, we need to keep a preferred parent uh, entry on, on every routing entry we have uh, in context of every routing entry. It was, it was simply very difficult to manage it in the current space. The RPI or the ripple packet information, this is the the, this is the change which is required in the data plane. Every data packet needs to carry the six byte header, which has RPL instance ID and some other uh, information such as sender rack, which helps in loop avoidance and detection. Uh, so this is required to be carried in every data packet. This, now this, we ended up, this, this required to be major handling. So we ended up using a net filter, uh, net filter mechanism, wherein all the packets were routed to the user space using libnfq. And then the, in, in the user space, we ended up adding, adding the 6-byte header and then sending it back to the kernel. It meant tossing the packets between user space and kernel space. It was not very, it, just, it won't be very performance uh, efficient. But like I mentioned, we don't expect to handle thousands of millions of packets per second uh, for the test unit. So it will work very okay. Same goes for SRH addition. All the packets have to be, uh, have to be going to the Ripple daemon in the user space where the SRH packet was, uh, SRH was getting added and then populated forward. Interestingly, for automatic handling on border router, there was no need for automatic handling because border router does not make any decision based on uh, metrics. Border does not have to border router does not have to make any path selection. So 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 uh, it made for, for our deployment, we didn't have, we didn't face any issues with the metric handling all the world. Having said that, if, you're, if we ended, if we would have ended up something like Raspberry Pi or any other device mm -hmm. on the 6L or 6L, we would have required this. So uh, the requirements that we we, we look forward from our we, 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 we aim to add to the Linux kernel. Some of it is already there, as we have been, uh, as I understand. The LQI RSSI reporting on per incoming packet, this is important for metric calculation. Uh, the unicast transmission success or failure with MAC retries, the number of MAC retries, this is also needed for my metric calculation. The routing table interfaces, the, for non storing mode, MOP, we need to store preferred parent. Apart from the preferred parent the information, there are some other information such as path sequence and some additional tracks that are required to be stored on per routing interfaces. This is there for storing more operation as well. From the neighbor table and parent table, we need to keep we, we need to have a way of keeping the metric information on per neighbor basis. So uh, this is something which is difficult to handle right now. And like we had some discussion before, there is a possibility of doing it on per neighbor basis, uh, but we still have to look into it how to do it. Similarly, we need a way in the neighbor table to identify potential fields. But like I mentioned, if we have a mechanism to have some specific information in context to uh, 
uh, neighbor entry, then we can do this as well. It's, it will be a big deal. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it from uh, my side. Uh, any questions? Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, for the for the first item, the LQA value, uh, IQA value, that's actually being reported already. That's a recent addition to one of the last kernels. I sent you the mail about that. Um, for the failure and success reporting on the MAC address, I mentioned that before. That's something I need to think and get that in. But I see that there is a good use case for that. And I just need to figure out where to put that and if it's a socket option or if it's just something you get for the neighbor. I, I don't know yet. For the routing stuff, that's something I most of the time avoid. So. You're looking. <laughs> Actually, in fact, uh, you know, in the context, I I checked out the FR routing tutorial last net day, and I ended up seeing something called as routing information base and forwarding information base, and routing information base has been maintained in the user space, uh, which is a similar architecture that we, we I mean, a similar design that we would have to have in the space. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so. I have absolutely no clue about Ripple routing, first. <laughs> um, but this, this sounds to me like what you would need is to have the routing daemon in user space with some special way to feed the data from the kernel to the user space on pretty much every single packet that you receive, I guess. And um, then you could keep all of the information in that routing daemon and just feed back the necessary information to the kernel that the kernel needs to actually send the packets, which is what we would normally do in, in FR routing because we try to keep as little information in the kernel as possible. So it only has the, the routing table entries. Um, I, I don't know enough about the protocol to, to know whether this is feasible to do for Ripple. Um, I don't know what, the, what exactly the extra information is that the kernel needs. Um, I suppose you already have the interface to get all the packet data because you could just run a PCAP essentially on the Ripple interface and just feed the extra information there. I guess that's not the cleanest way of doing things, um, but yeah, yeah. We we try to minimize the, the information that we have in the kernel. That that is the the routing approach on normal IP routing, essentially. So uh, you know, one of the things that I was trying to check uh, how would Ripple differentiate or differentiate itself from the routing protocols, and some of the information here, and I'm not sure if other routing protocols are making use of such information. I don't think any other routing protocol in the FR routing suite makes use of this information as in the UBS transmission success. It does it. So the, the closest thing in similarity is the Babel routing protocol, which is, is just mesh routing. So it, it only really uses uh, information on its hello packets. So there, the thing is, because it only uses its own packets to, to, to determine link quality, it's far easier to deal with the problem. So. Yes. So, no more questions on this. No more comments. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think the, the routing part is really kind of a bit problematic. You need to get more people involved in that. Um, that's not really my area of expertise. So, um, and other people don't know about Ripple as well. So that's. So, um, I used one time the Armstrong Ripple implementation, and but this is only, uh, I mixed them, anyways. I don't know, I think it's a storing mode, which is the simple part, and the non-storing is the complicated part, because um, it needs to add something in the IP options to uh, some more headers, and I don't know, uh, I don't know where, where the Linux kernel is actually doing that at some point. Um, and also, you only you also need to say, yeah, please don't drop the package, because the Linux kind of will drop everything, which it doesn't know. But there's recently added uh, this FS entry to say that. But um, yeah, it, it sounds like a big challenge to do that. Yeah. Yes, non storing mode is the most popular mode, actually. Yeah. Anyway, because Deployment-wise, non-storing mode is more easier to deploy than storing mode. Okay. Because you require more memory in the system. Yeah, I, I see. Okay.
Thank so you. in fact, an SMOP should have a more higher priority uh, of you know mm -hmm. integration than than storing. Yeah, I see. But I'm, I would already be lucky that the storing mode. <laughs> I would be very happy when the storing mode, when we have an implementation where the storing mode would be running very well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we have something like 20 minutes or so left, if that's a correct thing. Um, and the only topics we still have to talk. There we go. So um, basically, we are here in the discussion area now. Um, I wanted to use this time to uh, talk to you about my other subsystems, actually, how you find interacting with NetF Core, how actually you um, are useful all the generic tools they have are. For example, I often have problems um, when there are reports on the syscaller or the self-test coverage or something, they always target the, the big subsystems like Ethernet, IP, and the core subsystems, but they never really touch the other subsystems because I guess they are not even enabled by default in this kind of tool. Right? For example, for self-test, I just started to write up the self-test for six levels around. And one of the problems I have is that um, to get it running correctly, you would have to have at least um, our hardware simulator driver enabled in the kernel config to get something to test on. So we don't actually have any hardware, but just simulated hardware. Um, and then you would actually best would be to have some user space tools installed as well for configurations. And all these things are a bit complicated uh, for me to actually get into the. Uh, I mean, I can get them to the kernel, that's not a problem. But how they're getting used by all the tools. Um, for example, when I heard in your presentation about CAM, you also have like, like CAM tests. That's something you're only using yourself and you're testing only on your side, or is that something you are planning to integrate into K self tests, or is there anything going on in that direction? Um, yeah, we have these tools and they are called CAM tests, but they are not really ready for automatic testing yet. Um, I had a short look at uh, Titan, this network um, testing stuff, but this is a beast of its own. I have no. Yeah, uh, probably. Uh, I mean, you, you actually, Titan is the one where you need this Eclipse implementation. Sorry. You need the Eclipse implementation? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's really hard to get it like a test setup working, I would say. So it's not something you could throw into a case of test, for example, because the dependencies on that are just too complicated. Yes. Yeah. At least I had it so far that it compiles on, on Debian, but to get really into it, it just took too much time to get it done in the remaining 10% or so. Um, so we have some tests, but I I don't think they run quite well automated. So, so you, is it problematic for you that you are not getting any coverage of these automatic testing tools and all the other things that are running on the core initiatives on that app? Or is that okay with you? Or is it something you want to improve? Or uh, if I had time, I would like to improve. But <laughs> no, I mean, it, like the question is, well, it's, it's not really. I wonder um, how much we have to do with this like small niche subsystems to actually get exposed a bit more and how much we can ask from these two developers to actually enable more options for example. I was wondering if I could push push them a bit more to have like uh, 15 or 4 configuration options enabled to actually um, for, for syscaller and yeah. for yeah. stuff like that. So. Just ask for it to, to have it enabled in the default uh, in, in the dev config or dev configs for uh, yeah, for x86. Um, so we get quite a lot of this caller, this callizer feedback. Yes. Um. 
Okay, so I'll just go ahead and ask. Well, I was just wondering how about the... Yeah, um, since uh, you can buy can USB adapters, just plug them into your Ubuntu, everything works. Uh, it's it's enabled by default on... I mean, that is why actually Xcenter wrote the, um, um, the hardware simulator driver, which is similar to the one from wireless. So they actually yeah. can have this kind of deployments and automatic testing without any hardware attached to it. So I was, I was it did actually help a lot for this case of just uh, stuff I'm, I'm working yeah, the, the this collider just in air quotes uh, just tests uh, setting up interfaces, tearing it down, and if there are some not handled null pointer de references or use after free or something like that, you get you get a nice uh, report back. They don't even use uh, hardware or simulated hardware for testing. I think. Okay. But um, but that's more than nothing, no? Is it? So, um, um, one more point, we have uh, Visual Can, so you can actually sim create a CAN bus without having any CAN hardware, and uh, so you can do point-to-point -point transfers just locally between two applications or whatever, and uh, last year was QEMU was extended with CAN support, so we can use virtual can on the host system to talk with a uh, system inside of QEMU to simulate some kind of transfers and do testing. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, some other things that happen. I mean, the KSF does things spark actually me when um, Eric did the rework of the, um, of the fragment he had, frequency handling in IPv6, and that broke uh, IPv6 uh, on 15 or 4 for us. So we had to actually figure that out. I wanted to have a way for this kind of big refactorings coming from NetF Core um, to have, it gives them a way to actually test it on other subsystems as well. I mean, but I don't want to put the pressure on them to have like hardware setup and stuff like that for them. So that's why I want to have like some KSF test functionality that they actually can run and then do a big refactoring or something. I mean, we figured we found it before it hit uh, the release, so that was fine. Alexander fixed it already. Um, but I mean, that was something um, that sparked an interest for me to actually have that a bit more of my testing there as well. So I was wondering how other subsystems are handling that. Um, also, I'm wondering anyone think about using stuff like XDP and EPPF uh, on these niche things? I mean, I know it's it's not really for performance for me. I mean, it's not like I want to have like wire speed that's easy to achieve with something like fifteen to four. But um, one use case or one one really just an idea I had was um, we have a situation where you do um, hardware-based acknowledgements on the on the link layer uh, on the hardware itself because we have really strict uh, timing requirements on the link layer for that. And if you could do that on uh, XDP with EPPF, it might actually be nicely doable from the kernel side as well. Because I'm not sure with all the scheduling involved, you can do that from the normal process. But nobody played the server, I guess, right? Because it really seems to me. It's a microphone. Um, so, uh, speaking for the routing area, what, what is happening with all the hardware capabilities of, of switches and routers is that they are being kind of hidden between existing Linux functionality with it, which is then offloaded into the hardware. So uh, the way we, we would do this for the routing table is the routing table is just installed normally in the kernel and then propagated down to the chip. And the same is currently happening with TC filter rules. So if you create a TC filter rule from user space in the kernel, the kernel will also propagate it down to the hardware through an API and the hardware will apply the filter for you and then the, the packet might never even enter the kernel. I mean, I, I, that, that I follow mostly on the methods, but I, I was wondering more like having a softmac um, implementation for like automatic uh, retransmit handling, which is normally deployed by the hardware, but some of the ships are so cheap they don't even support that. Um, so we need to augment that somehow in, in the software side, but I have problems timing-wise in the current subsystem which actually handle that. I was wondering if I um, extended to have XDP uh, running there directly on the hardware, directly with the driver comes in, and then I can actually make the decision and send the X frame back if the time environment. I mean, I know that XDP is only supported for Ethernet right now. I mean, I know that a lot of people have 
do some some tricks here. But I'm wondering if that is actually interesting or not because that would be the best sense to work. Um, for, before I hand over to the mic, um, the the distinction here is that. Uh, I'm not completely sure about the features and everything here, but I think this is something you actually need to do, right? So to implement the protocol properly, uh, you, you need this functionality. And I, I would be very reluctant to rely on XDP to implement a function that must be provided for the, the entire thing to work correctly. So I wouldn't want to move somewhere where I absolutely need to have this XDP part just to get it working correctly. So there, there should always be some kind of standard kernel implementation that does the same thing somewhere. And it sounds like it does need to be in the kernel to get the timing correctly. Um, so I, I don't think XDP is a good way to, to solve this particular problem. Yeah, I mean, so far, it's only, I'm only thinking about it. Because right now, this driver just does not support it. Um, and yeah, it's just not there. So that means if um, there's no retransmit of the frame with the act failing or something. So you don't have the functionality at all right now. So every time someone asks me for a recommendation for a specific hardware or something, I say, please ignore that one, but everything else. Um, but yeah, so I was wondering how to do that. I need to actually figure out if it's possible to do just augment that in the software layer we have. If that is fine timing-wise, then I don't really care that much, but if not, I need to find it. So I'll accept and then Yeah, um, I think so in the acknowledge frame, there is not any user payload. It is just when a frame is received and the acknowledge request bit is set, sent this, I don't know, the, that's only, um, there's even no address information. It's just the sequence number. Yeah, uh, so, so I don't know where XDP fits here because it should be handed in the... The problem uh, I'm facing is that if I would do the soft map implementation of the, of the um, setting out the egg again, um, it would be way down the stack coming from different MetaF uh, core stuff being in between. And I don't know if I can get the timing requirements needed for the for the egg being sent out. So that's why I was wondering if, if I can rely on XDP, which is really directly uh, at this stage where it comes out from the driver, um, or we need to think about having it like a, a hack inside the driver that actually um, uses information and sends the hack back. So, yeah, so far I know XDP tackles one issue in the, uh, in the networking stack, which is the socket buffer. So you don't working with socket buffer, but this is also what you need to do, uh, be done there. Um, you have your uh, memory space where, I, I don't know, we, we even don't have any transceiver which supports DMA or something uh, where you can get, um, is the acknowledgement set and is this one address which belongs to me and then send it back? Yeah, as I said, I mean, for XCP, I know the use case is really performance and all the other things. That's not really something I want to use it. I want to use it for something else. But I mean, the feedback I get here is that I should try at least get it inside in the normal softmax stack and try to work it out there. And if that's not possible, then I can go back to the drawing board. And yeah, some note also on this, there's also one transceiver which doesn't support also the collision detection and avoidness. Uh, yeah, the, the, I don't know how this can be done. <laughs> So with the back off periods and yeah, there was yeah, the, this Texas Instruments. Uh, let's see what we're I believe I believe that uh, doing uh, XDP work for low power device is uh, kind of dangerous work because you you might easily miss packets and having non signal to the structure that you are using for following the packet. So, I mean, uh, if you do work with XDP with higher level devices, it's very pretty easy to do line rate. But when you have um, CPU um, issues, then you miss packets and you don't know how to, uh, you, you start replicating work down in the kernel, down in the <laughs> XDP. So, uh, good point. So, actually, I will drop the idea for now. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thanks,
So I had looked into XDP, but we're not yet at the point where we've been really able to experiment with it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I know, I mean, it's only used in e right now. I know that the white team had some work with some parts of it as well, but nobody else. And um, I was just wondering if it might make sense or not. Okay. So we have like three minutes left before we have to go to the talk for a bit. So I'll just say we have like a few more minutes to actually breathe a bit and drink something. Else. Okay. So thanks a lot for participating here. And that's a great talk and a few minutes.